what the concept of um, climate action means at a different scale. I think quite a few of us are passionate and thinking about and recognizing that it's not simply an exercise in dropping down climate governance that already exists at national and international scales to the local level and, and reproducing them. But that working at the local scale and, and working with this concept of place means we have to sort of rethink and re-engage with what climate action is and how we think about the relationship between, between the local scale and, and climate change as a problem. And, and that's a huge intellectual undertaking um, as much as it is a practical one. And so I think it's it was an ambition of, of, of Dan and myself and, and, and also Rosanna um, to use, as Dan was saying, the resource that we have at our disposal most, which is students who are passionate about these issues to help us with that significant intellectual task. Um, and so that's how this came about. And we circulated a, a series of sort of broad themes that we were that we knew we were interested in, but but then allowed the students to take those in directions that would have most interested them. And what's ultimately resulted is not something we could have foreseen. It's new ideas. These were not research projects that we just designed and were looking for somebody to carry out. They were projects that that started small and, and became what they were because of the hard work of the students. And, and that's what we would love to be able to do again this this coming year and, and years into the future. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll stop there and, and hand back to Rosanna to introduce the students um, and yeah really excited by to hear again from from some of these students that I, I supervise some of them and, and and not others so it'll be great to hear from them and hopefully uh, inspire next or this year's um, student body to, to sort of build on some of this work and take it forward um, so Rosanna back to you Thanks. Um, I just wanted to say that we have a mixture of live and pre-recorded presentations. So the first one is pre-recorded. So I'm going to turn up my volume, but you might need to turn up your volume as well so you can hear them well. Um, but hopefully it should all be fine. And please, someone message me in the chat if you can't actually hear the audio. But I'm going to try and do the first one now. Um, the first one is Nina, who is a carbon management student and she wrote her dissertation on adaptation in Edinburgh. Um, so I'm just going to share it now. Is that working? I'm just going to assume yes. <laughs> yeah. Hi everyone, I'm Nina, sorry that I can't be there live with you today. Uh, um, but uh, Rosanna asked me to uh, record a uh, presentation and I hope that this will help you too a bit. I will just share my screen with you quickly. Okay, so um, this is about my dissertation and my experience working with PECAN. Um, we'll first just go quickly through my dissertation overview, findings and process, and then about what I think is going to be important to know for you and um, why I chose to work with PECAN and why it might be the right fit for you. So my dissertation title was Exploring How the Interplay of Adaptation and Mitigation Motivates Place-Based Climate Action in Edinburgh. Um, and I wrote my dissertation um, for the MSc Carbon Management Program. Um, it was based on interviews. I also had to add in a small survey uh, due to COVID. Um, and yeah. So um, my dissertation was basically focusing on Edinburgh as a place-based component and um, on the relationship between um, adaptation and mitigation, on who is responsible for adaptation and mitigation, um, how a potential integrated approach would work, and um, also what the public's role in climate change action is. I can go through all my findings with you um, very detailed now because there's just not enough, enough time for it. Um, so um, very quickly, um, I found a disconnect between adaptation and mitigation, a clear prioritization of mitigation over adaptation, um, which also agrees with um, most of the literature that I read. Um, yeah, there's a big um, issue with institutional fragmentation. So there are lots of different departments and lots of different organizations that don't really work together as well as they should. And this creates an issue with organizational co collaboration. Um, within departments, between departments, but also between multiple different organizations and institutions. A very big issue is uh, the lack of capacity um, on pretty much all levels. Um, so a lack of capacity um, uh, regarding um, 
the workforce, regarding time and regarding funding. Um, my dissertation also discusses um, the effectiveness of an integrated approach, which, um, well, experts were not quite um, agreeing with one another completely, as most found the idea interesting, but were still kind of doubting how um, effectively this could be um, executed, particularly because of the lack of capacity and the issue with the uh, communication in uh, organizations. What I was very surprised by that it was um, that enthusiastically um, answered was um, the whole uh, question about the public involvement and the public's role in climate change. So um, getting importance of public involvement was highlighted a lot and the necessity of a public behavior change, um, which led us to um, talk about how to communicate the importance of climate change action to the wider public, which is um, kind of a tricky thing. And I found very interesting because, um, well, you can't just throw numbers and stats at people and um, expect them to understand um, climate change and why action has to be taken. Um, but different groups respond to different things. So you have to differently explain to everyone so that people understand why it's so important and why it's such an issue and why we have to fight it. Um, yeah, this also goes hand in hand a bit with the necessity of public engagement in local communities. Local communities are very important for climate change action, particularly the adaptation part, since adaptation is a place-based thing mostly. And um, yeah, people are not very engaged in local um, politics, um, not as much as they should be at least. So um, yeah, there has to be more encouragement and engagement done. Um, my dissertation also discussed nature-based solutions and engineering-based solutions, um, mainly talking about um, how nature-based solutions, since they are a natural version of an integrated approach of adaptation and mitigation just on based on what they are, nature-based solutions, um, yeah, uh, in comparison to engineering-based solutions. Um, here, I have to say that the experts were um, unclear. Like, everyone did think that nature-based solutions are a great thing, um, but no one could really, like, it's not really proven yet. Not enough research has been done to say that nature-based solutions are better. Uh, some people said that it was important to have both. So that's uh, also what I can draw from what everyone said that um, both have to exist, they have to coexist. We need both, but it is important that nature-based solutions are given some more thought and some more importance as they are currently, but like this has to go a bit further, of course. Um, but yeah, so it's going into the right direction. Um, yeah, so those are the findings of my dissertation. Uh, just going through my process quickly, because I think that might be interesting for you. I started with Lots and lots of reading, lots of papers on adaptation, mitigation, the relationship between the two of them, an integrated approach, um, anything regarding the public, pub um, local governance, um, anything that relates to my topic at all to figure out what I approximately wanted to base my research on. Um, then there was, it was about deciding methodology, which was like the topic was always thought of being um, with interviews. Um, and that fit perfectly with what I wanted to do because I like talking to people. So that was ideal for me. Um, yeah, so next step was finding experts to interview, which um, was a bit harder than I thought it would be just because um, lots of people were very occupied with other things due to COVID. And yeah, well, didn't have that much time for um, doing interviews with students. But um, I did create a small survey then uh, based on the interview questions and sent that out to people. And well, turned out that people prefer talking to me in person or like uh, virtually um, instead of filling out a survey. So I had more interviews in the end. And yeah, so interview questions had to be created for holding the interviews. Um, and for me personally, I adapted my research questions um, after the interviews a bit um, so that I could actually talk more about the things that uh, were important to the experts and that they give insights on, since that was the whole purpose of this methodology. Um, yeah, after the interviews uh, transcribing, I would recommend you to use Otto, which is an app that I used 
um, it records and also automatically transcribes. You obviously have to go through it and rework it, but it's way, way easier than if you have to transcribe everything by hand. Um, afterwards, um, I did the coding. In my case, that was color coding. So, so you read and reread and reread and reread your transcriptions and see um, what was important, which are the essences of what people said, um, how can they con be connected. So I put that all in a big spreadsheet and color coded everything. So it was easier for me to, um, in the end, put everything into my results and discussion section. Then the big part of writing started for me. Of course, I had written some things before, like methodology and uh, some parts of my literature review. But um, yeah, my big part of writing started after this. Um, after you're done writing, it's important to proofread. Proofread yourself, get someone else to proofread it if, they, if you can find someone. Um, one of my friends proofread it for me, which was a huge help, especially since English is not my first language. And I do sometimes still also make those tiny mistakes um, that native speakers can easily catch. And yeah, so that's important also. Um, and of course, um, don't think that that's all there is to it. It's a dissertation after all. So you will encounter issues. Nothing will go as planned always. Like that's just not how it works. So you will have to rework sections throughout the process. Um, I had to rework multiple parts of um, especially literature review, but generally everything you have to rework. So just be aware that that's a thing. OK, so um, now what I think is important to know for you is first, don't be freaked out um, if others are at a different stage of writing their dissertations than you are. This will happen. This is normal. Everyone works differently. Everyone's dissertations have different structures, so they have to be at different points at different times. Um, I, for example, started writing most of my parts pretty late and I had friends who were like after like the first couple weeks already at like 5,000 words and I had pretty much nothing written down. But that's fine because there are different things to every different dissertation. So don't be freaked out about that. Everyone works differently also. And um, yeah, still talk to others in your course. It'll help. It's just nice because um, they're going through the same thing. So hopefully you'll be able to meet in person then and all like we did during the whole uh COVID thing so um it was a bit harder to meet every single one of your friends um but yeah still talk to your course mates they're going through the same thing it'll help and um it's nice to talk about it with someone who actually knows what you're dealing with um yeah important do some planning in advance in advance before you write everything down and make sure that you do um enough reading about the topic before you start Obviously, only if that fits your methodology. Um, but yeah, it, if you plan before and you don't just immediately start writing stuff down, there's less rewriting you have to do, which is generally nice because it saves you a lot of time and a lot of stress and anger. Um, but yeah, um, generally, very important thing. If you're doing interviews, um, use multiple recording devices or apps, both if possible, because well, I, there are enough stories of people who um, did not use multiple ones and then it didn't work or it broke or something and there's no recording or no transcription, which is not ideal. For me, it usually worked out quite well to use um, just a normal recording thingy that you have on every phone, like the iPhone recording thing, but I'm quite sure you have that on uh, Android and stuff also. Um, then the Otter app and I also, since with COVID, we couldn't actually have face-to-face uh, -face interviews. Um, I did mine with um, Microsoft Teams and I recorded them on Microsoft Teams. That worked out quite fine for me. And then the last part, um, why I chose to write with Pecan. Well, I found the topic very interesting that was offered. Usually everyone always talks about mitigation, but adaptation is kind of not that much talked about, but I'm really interested in um, in adaptation also. So it was just really great um, to have both combined in my topic. Also, it was really important for me to contribute to something like that might be useful for someone or an organization as PECAN. Um, that doesn't mean that all other dissertations aren't read by anyone or don't like aren't useful or purposeful, they for sure are. But I just had the feeling that if I write a dissertation 
with somewhere else, like not with an organization that I would write it to markers, would read it, and that's it. No one will ever read it again. Again, not saying that that's always the case. Um, I was just feeling, it, it made me feel better um, to write with Pekin, to contribute to a database or in general gathered information for a network. Um, also, yeah, I was able to conduct interviews and talk to people instead of just analyzing text or calculating. That's obviously personal preference, but it just fit very well with uh, what I wanted to do. And yeah, after working with Pekin, I can say that everyone I work with is really nice and helpful. Um, for me, like I was mostly working with Rosanna, but also with Matt, and they're both super nice and helpful and they give you a good feeling. Like whenever I had um, any meetings with them, I came out of those meetings encouraged, like no one's ever discouraging you. And it's just a really nice atmosphere to work with. It's also quite nice because there's a team of students working um, with Pekin dissertations. Um, so you are you feel like you're just really not alone in it, um, which is, I think, generally nice. Um, yeah, I hope that I could answer stuff that you were thinking of or like potential questions that you could have had, could have. Um, if you have any more questions, there is my email address. Um, feel free to just um, send me an email if you want to know anything. Um, yeah, generally, I really hope you have good luck with your dissertation and this helped and that the rest of the meeting is also going to be helpful for you and helps you be able um, to choose um, where you want to write your dissertation in. Bye. Okay, um, I'm just going to keep moving us on quite quickly. Um, so next, we're going to hearing from Robert. Um, and I also just wanted to say that if people want to ask questions or talk in the chat bar, then that's definitely encouraged. Um, so I'm just going to hand over to Robert now. Hi. Uh, yeah, sorry, I'm just going to figure out if I can get the screen share to work. Sure. Like I did earlier. Um, right. Uh, oh, there. Right. Okay. Hello. Um, I'm Rob and uh, I was where you were 12 months ago. I was a uh, master's student at, uh, for carbon management and I did uh, my dissertation um, in, with PECAN as well. And I had the good fortune of having Matt supervise me. And this is probably the number one thing I would like to communicate to you throughout this presentation is don't be intimidated by your dissertation. It's a really fun um, galvanizing project that really it can bring you so much um, if you're really interested in it and if you really want to commit the time to it. So my um, dissertation was talking, uh, the title was talking to business leaders about climate change, a framework for understanding motivations for sustainable business model innovation. So I decided to focus on the private sector which is basically corporations and businesses and a whole bunch of other um, entities, like me and Matt just wrote a chapter on that, uh, which make up a massive part of the stock and flow of greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere. But together, they're also quite a strong economic, logistical, innovative powerhouse that can make a real difference in tackling climate change. Um, however, the majority of businesses are not inherently altruistic and they're driven by sort of financial motivators. Um, and so I decided that climate change needs to be communicated to business leaders in a way that is um, sort of through business language of competitive advantage, financial and, um, you know, just sort of competitive angles. And so, however, I did some more research and I found that sustainable business models or businesses that engage in climate action essentially perform better, especially in the long term than traditional business models. So those that do not engage in climate action. So I wondered why that was. And I proposed that maybe these um, benefits, economic and uh, competitive need to be communicated in a more clear manner in a more sort of structured way. So what I ended up doing was conducting a integrative literature review integrative literature review, you basically sort of have a set of keywords and you go search um, various databases and you sort of read and, and throw out ones that don't really match what you're looking for and you collect the ones that do. 
And so I did that for about 50 papers and gray literature and reliable websites, reports, etc. And I condensed all that knowledge into five main motivators. Um, and then I took that framework and I applied it to the Edinburgh business context. And I interviewed five different business leaders in four different industries. And um, I gained some further knowledge through that. So the framework is what you can see in front of you here. Um, so those are 32 different benefit codes. So through 32 essentially benefits, either economic or competitive. And those are clustered into 13 different sub benefits. And those are further than condensed into five major motivators. And so each one of these benefits in my dissertation have quite a comprehensive description and explanation. But again, like Nina said, we only have 10 minutes and I need to get through this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, just give you a broad overview of each motivator. So the financial motivator was basically describes how um, engaging in climate action or a business engaging in climate action directly generates greater profits or greater economic income. And under that cost savings was a massive one. Essentially, um, you need fewer inputs to create the same output um, that saves the business money. And also you're not using as many resources. You, you've got fewer processes, less carbon emitted into the atmosphere. And then also capital acquisition, for instance, is um, businesses uh, looking for investors. Investors are interested in future proofing their investments. So thinking about climate change makes that more approachable for them. Then external uh, motivators, the biggest one there that I want to talk about is customer acquisition. It shows that now, especially in Western societies, uh, customers are more keen on um, climate aware businesses. And so they're more inclined to shop in these places or even corporations, they don't want to really purchase like, you know, non-sustainable palm oil anymore. Then internal, um, the big one there, the most interesting one to me was employee productivity, um, which is a motivator for businesses because employees would work harder if they knew that their business is sustainable rather than they were just helping the man at the top gain more money. Um, and then facilitating innovation was also important there because businesses who would start to think about how can we reduce our emissions, a lot of innovation came from that, which generates competitive advantage in a field. Legal was really interesting that uh, legal motivators were quite abstract and still quite sort of in the future. Uh, the interesting there was avoiding climate litigation. So increasingly there's talk of sort of holding businesses to account on certain reducing emissions. However, um, they, that is still quite a future concept. And when I came to the interviews, that was still not really quite understood by businesses, but um, businesses could get legally punished if they don't, hold themselves accountable for their emissions in the future. And then risk mitigation really ties it all together. Physical risks is your standard climate risks. So um, physical risks can be damage to your communications lines, your infrastructure, your factory where you're producing stuff, et cetera, because of flooding, anything climate related. And then market risks were actually you are the risk of being outcompeted by other businesses who are being more sustainable because of these reasons that I showed you just now. And so um, that's, it's almost like a, 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 a virtuous cycle of, oh, we need to be more, more sustainable so that we're more competitive so that we can outcompete our competition who's trying to be more sustainable. So yeah, so then I took that and I applied it to the Edinburgh business context. And what I found was, was that some of the benefit codes actually didn't emerge. So the, the benefits that I found in the literature didn't emerge in a practical context of applying it to Edinburgh. So that's not to say that these benefits are invalid and the literature that I took this from is not trustworthy, but it shows that um, benefits, economic benefits have, are dependent on the context. So for example, in Edinburgh, um, it's a service heavy uh, private sector. And so these uh, ones that were particularly hinged on uh, for example, product service systems under external, you know, you don't have many industries there that are turning a product into a service. So that didn't really apply. And some were really abstract, like they weren't really worried about um, the, the people I interviewed weren't really worried about the breakdown of society, for instance. So 
Um, those weren't really taken seriously. However, I, I, I would include them because they were found in the uh, literature, right? And also avoiding climate litigation, like I said before, that's a future problem. They don't really have a grasp of that. On the flip side, I also found that some benefits emerged from the literature that hadn't actually been shown, um, sorry, some benefits emerged from the empiricism that hadn't actually emerged in the literature. The most notable for what, for me, I thought was under external, and that is participa participation with city climate commissions. And so I interviewed a lot of um, business leaders who are also commissioners, and they said, oh, actually one of the benefits that I'm experiencing from doing climate action is I've got a seat at the Edinburgh Climate Commission, and I can discuss my problems, I've got an opportunity to network, et cetera, et cetera. So I found that really interesting. Um, then in my conclusion, I basically sort of summed up, how is this framework useful? So I found for the private sector, it's great to communicate to business leaders so they can have a sort of a guiding thoughts of how to explore further um, possibilities for their climate action and why they should be incentivized to do so. Um, in an academic setting, this framework is certainly very um, fallible. You can find a lot of errors there and I'm sure you could pull it apart and, 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 and add things and apply it to different contexts and it can be appraised, developed, broken down, everything. And so I think there's a lot of room to explore this framework academically. And then uh, for local climate groups, this framework offers a strategic structure through which to approach their local private sector entities and say, have you thought about participating in our climate group because these are the benefits for you. For example, think of your external motivators, think of your financial motivators, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not sure how I'm doing for time, but I've actually included some general advice at the end that I'd like to go through. Is that okay with you, Rosanna, or what, do you, what are you saying? If you do it, super quick. Okay, super quick. So, uh, okay, I'm only gonna go for the main ones then. So the, the last, okay, the last three are probably the most important. So writing a dissertation is really difficult and that's okay. If it was easy, everybody would have one. Um, so if you struggle, if you're finding it difficult, that's okay, don't worry. Everybody has the same struggle where you just wanna put your, hat, your face in your hands and just give up, but don't push through. Importantly, plan first, write second. There's nothing worse than writing 3000 words and then realizing it's not on your topic and having to delete it and it's about two weeks work. It's tough. Um, lastly, progress is not linear. So if you have days where you're writing nothing, if you have months where you're writing nothing, that's okay. Because some days you're gonna write a thousand words up to, some days you're gonna write 200, some days you're gonna write none. And um, take conscious breaks, they help you're going to process the questions that you have in your mind um, subconsciously, that's okay. And what I really want to point out is uh, you won't fail and you won't run out of time. Trust me, everybody's gone through this process and it's really, really unlikely that's going to happen and it's not going to happen to you, I promise. Oh, and record things on two devices. I was that guy that Nina was talking about. Okay, thank you. Robert I forgot that that was you that was um that was a great presentation um okay so the next one is Yao um Matt was actually Yao's supervisor so again if you have questions just put them in the chat and I'm going to try and sorry I'm just moving us along because I'm aware that we're tight for time um here we go uh, hopefully that's all fine Hey everyone, my name is Yao. Today, I'd like to give a brief presentation on my dissertation and my PECON experience. Now, let's move into the dissertation process. I'll begin with how I selected my topic and why I think it is important to do this research. The aim of me doing this master's or for this dissertation is to figure out a way to most effectively tackle climate change. And from a capitalism point of view, I feel the most effective way to tackle environmental challenges is to utilize the power of business. Therefore, being interested in business oriented environmentalism in the private sector, my initial idea was to look at environmentally friendly business here in Taipei. I found the literature suggests that small and medium sized enterprises are considered less likely to voluntarily contribute to climate engagement. 
And it is because of the fact that they have less resources and less public attention. So they seem to only focus on meeting basic legislative needs. That's why some scholars have also expressed the under-research with a focus on SMEs in the context of environmental strategies adoptions. However, at an international level, I feel that whether these academic assumptions are still applicable is becoming more and more doubtful when considering how the recent trend is emerging over the past few years. And at a national level, it is important that Taiwan put more energy into understanding how SMEs can have an impact on climate engagement because Taiwan's economy is SME heavy. So that's why I think it's important that we need to study more on the relationship between SMEs and climate mitigation. Next, I started looking into SMEs that are engaging in climate actions here in Taiwan. It wasn't too difficult because there aren't many of them in Taiwan engaging in climate actions, as I found out later. In the initial phase, a list of around 20 SMEs were identified, and I then categorized them into two groups according to their ways of engaging with climate mitigation. I discovered the first group through a noticeable event which is at the end of 2019, more than 500 companies voluntarily pledged to commit to net zero by 2030. And among them, eight companies are based in Taiwan. This event is eye-catching to me because I wonder why these SMEs are voluntarily choosing to commit to net zero if it doesn't seem like an action that will help their company to gain profit. The second group are formed because I was thinking about the relationship between tackling climate change and renewable energy. I discovered that the, this newly emerged group of SMEs is um, due to a major policy shift a few years ago, which opened up a new market for the green economy in Taiwan. And this is why they're mostly startups. So with the growing demand for green power, it is natural that um, more players, SMEs, will be more willing to participate in this business. But I was thinking whether they join in this market because they're keen to help combat climate emergency or was it just the impetus from a market opportunity? During reviewing literature, I read about categorizations and typologies of sustainable business models built by academics and business practitioners. And I was keen to see whether these SMEs engaging in climate action echoes the implementation of these strategies. So that brought me to the first research question. How are Taiwanese SMEs changing their existing models or implementing any sustainable strategy, if at all, to cater for a transition to net zero? The second research question is, how are they designing and implementing the targets that they commit to? Also, what are the barriers and opportunities? And given that some SMEs engagement with climate change doesn't seem to be driven by profit, yet the literature often assumes that businesses are always after the maximum profit. What are the underlying motivations of these SMEs to be engaged with climate action in Taiwan? I decided to use case study method to address my research questions. I also use content analysis along with the case studies. So I generated data from official websites and also international and local coverage on the B corporations committing to net zero. Table two shows the breakdown of the basic information of all case studies. As you can see, these are all service-based companies covering different industries, including law, accounting, and green electricity brokerage. I then proceeded to identify interviewees. I sent out 15 interview invitations and ended up with three. Table three shows the list of interviewees. 
I managed to talk to the CEO, the manager responsible for the B Corporation Affairs, the marketing manager, two founders, and one communication officer. With regards to analyzing the data, I categorize my data into theme types and examine the themes and common patterns that emerge across my data. Now, moving into the findings, I was very surprised to find a closed network of all these SMEs. I didn't expect that they would all know each other. In fact, I purposefully chosen a broader realm of samples to hopefully gain wider ranges of perspectives. So it was interesting to find out that um, some of them are even collaborating to assist um, some of the B Corps to reach their goal to reach net zero by 2030 by sourcing green electricity. The fact that they seem to all know each other shows that this is still a very small community. This also reinsures the validity of this place-based approach of the study. The three case studies comply with sustainable business model archetypes to various degrees. For instance, um, for the SMEs from the first theme, they both are on their ways to maximize material and energy efficiency, which is the first index from identifying sustainable business model archetypes, but at different stages. And for the second theme, other than facilitating a greener economy, it doesn't contain any other index. Yet interestingly, as the interviewee pointed out, they are very likely to start implementing sustainable strategies the moment they can because of the industry they're in. They feel that it would be more harmful to them than to large companies if they don't possess the green image. The SMEs from theme one has taken actions by implementing strategies internally and cooperating externally with the government or NGOs in order to reach net zero. I discover opportunities during the process of reaching this target, such as um, the B Corporation community, who plays the role of promoting the concept of net zero and sharing their knowledge to other companies in terms of how to actually do it. Another opportunity found, which is drawn from one of the case studies, is that there were unexpected marketing effects that brought them clients who share similar values. And for challenges, um, the biggest challenges is one of the SME's difficulty to source green electricity to help offset their emissions. Um, that points out one of the problems Taiwan is now facing. Most of them also pointed out that they wanted to do um, net zero, but they just didn't know how to because nobody else is doing it. One of the most interesting findings is the underlying motivations for the two themes. For the first theme, um, the two case studies both seem to be driven not by profit, instead a higher degree of personal motivations that are associated with their characteristics and beliefs. On the contrary, the case study for the second theme, it acknowledged that they are engaging with the chosen strategy mainly because of the promising future of green economy. But they also expressed um, their satisfaction in doing good business and um, the slight pressure for them to be more aware of environmental issues because of the industry they're in and the current company image that they hold. Now, for my PECON experiences, um, I want to say a massive uh, thank you to all um, the students in, in this organization, and also especially to Matt, uh, my supervisor, and Rosanna, who has been helping to organize these events so we can um, share and grow together. I feel it's really good to have a network um, like Pecan to make me feel like I'm not alone and to be pressured a little bit during the um, dissertation writing process, especially during the time of COVID. In terms of resources, um, 
I initially was going to look at Edinburgh and Matt sent me a list of companies, which I thought it could have been very useful, but unfortunately I didn't go with Edinburgh in the end because of COVID. But um, I definitely feel like it is a valuable experience because um, you learn and get inspiration from each other. I feel like although I don't have the opportunity to get to know everyone, um, it is definitely a good network to keep. I feel it would have been um, much more different if we weren't facing the COVID situation. But I think we've already done um, whatever we could. So thank you, everyone. And um, I now work for a English company called Sea Wind and is now working in the offshore wind industry. So if anyone is keen to know more about this industry, please don't hesitate to reach out. I hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, that was a very visually pleasing presentation. And um, I also think there was a nice um, way to just quickly say that um, because if you want to be in the PCAN or recall um, dissertation group, it doesn't mean that you have to do one that's based in Edinburgh or Scotland or the UK. It can be case based anywhere around the world. Um, so the last one before our Q&A, we are a bit behind schedule, but I think it's fine, um, is Mookie. So Mookie, do you want to share your screen? Yeah, sure. Cool. Okay, so uh, can you see my screen at the moment? Yes. Okay. Uh, wait a second. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I want to thank everyone for joining uh, today's discussion. Uh, my name is Muki, and I'm a, a student of environmental sustainability last year. So my dissertation uh, tried to help with facilitating peak and network collaboration for the local energy transition in Edinburgh. So uh, in my presentation, I want to cover five areas. First, introducing my research background's uh, importance. Second, about the subjects uh, I'm specifically looking at in my dissertation. Third, methodology. Fourth, my findings and relevant recommendations. And in the end, I want to talk something about my peaking experience. So uh, we all know like uh, climate urgency is a global challenge for all of us, but definitely we need different answers uh, to make our solutions more relevant to a specific local climate problem. I think this is also one of the reasons why PCAN was created. And also in this PCAN network, uh, it emphasized a lot on getting people together from different sectors to generate those really innovative ideas. Uh, so in my dissertation, I mainly use two theories. First is interactive governance, and second is sociological studies about values, beliefs, and ideology. Uh, as for the first, uh, Toffling has um, uh, described interactive governance as a more dynamic and flexible governing mode, comparing with a really hierarchical one. And also it emphasizes a lot about cross-sector stakeholders and to, uh, so that we can share uh, resources and expertise from different sectors and achieve those collective actions and go throughout those negotiations. I think uh, this theory really uh, relevant to the uh, governing mode that PCAN wants to develop. And actually, uh, one of the factors that would influence this collaboration uh, process is ideology. And to have a more comprehensive uh, definition of ideology, I use Digic's uh, uh, definition. It says uh, ideology can be uh, understood as a political or social system of ideas, values, and those uh, prescriptions of a certain group. And also, it has the function to organize and legitimize a certain group action. So from this definition, we can find that uh, ideology actually has the potential to facilitate those uh, collaboration. Uh, main art actually uh, classified three approaches to studying ideology. 
uh, I think whether it is conceptual, discursive, or quantitative, uh, they started to understand ideology from maybe uh, cognitive, uh, consider ideology as an idea and concept in our brain, or focusing on social, its interactions and communications in those social groups. Um, I think like uh, if we want to understand ideology, it can involve both a cognitive and social. And that's why I adopt DG's cognitive and social framework theory in my dissertation. So mainly I want to understand uh, what are those ideological beliefs existing within our PK network and then focusing on its social impact, especially uh, on the cross-sector stakeholder collaboration. Then, uh, so my dissertation wants to, wants to answer this question, how ideology is function within the PK network. I use Q methodology and interviews for my dissertation. Uh, Q methodology is actually a quantitative method, but it's really useful to analyze those subjective perspectives, including um, ideology. Um, from this picture, you can find uh, I designed a grid and then uh, uh, asked 12 of my participants uh, to rank the statements uh, I gave them. So those statements are, are some uh, features, some uh, ideological beliefs about sustainability. And uh, based on their rankings, uh, after that, uh, I, I managed to analyze those quantities. <coughs> yes. Yeah, so, and after, the uh, ranking process. I also had interviews with uh, my uh, participants. I uh, asked them about their impressions, ideas about those statements, and also uh, their background relating to sustainability. Uh, because according to co social constructivism, human knowledge is more likely socially situated based on their own circumstances. Therefore, having those interviews uh, actually gave me a lot of context-based data to help me understand better about their answers. Uh, I did three things for my research findings. First, uh, I did an ideology map try to understand what are those ideologies and their relationships. Then uh, based on the data and map, I try to identify some ideological divergence within the network, and uh, then summarize some potential conflicts uh, that might occur during the collaboration process. Uh, so from this ideology map, uh, I found that uh, a lot of ideas about uh, sustainability have uh, hugely associated with left liberal or conservative ideas. And for, uh, especially for approaches to energy transition, um, there are a lot of uh, initiatives on using technology and free market tools. So they are uh, also have some links with natural capitalism and classical liberalism ideas. Some small innovative ideas of redesigning uh, the energy governance system is real, uh, uh, relates to uh, some ecological ideas. Uh, here I also want to explain some terminologies. Uh, so for natural capitalism, it focuses a lot on greening our current economic system. So it will uh, advocate to uh, increase our productivity through technological solutions and also circular economy concept. Uh, for ecologism, a focusing more on using the local knowledge, uh, bring the local communities together to uh, govern, uh, to achieve the uh, sustainable development in our society. It's a re-understanding of human nature relations. Uh, uh, from my data, I identified two main ideological divergence within the group. Uh, first is liberty, second is human nature relations. As for the first, I think it's mainly about the understandings of liberty. Uh, it can be a, a more in a broad way, uh, whether it's focusing on the guarantee of uh, human rights or uh, environmental justice, or focusing more on the autonomy of an individual or a nation. Uh, second, human nature relations. Uh, the question is mainly about uh, can human be separated from nature or these two parts are integrated as a whole? And based on these two questions, I think there are three potential conflicts that might occur during our stakeholder dialogue. 
first about deciding the policy goals and agenda for the clean energy transition. Second, it's about uh, the relationships between different social sectors, government of free market, civil societies, etc. Third, about approaches to clean energy transition. And therefore, I uh, recommend that our stakeholder conversations could be focusing on three areas. Uh, first, about setting uh, policy priorities. I think this is mainly uh, based on an understanding or agreement about the human nature issues. For example, in terms of uh, the land use in Scotland uh, or in Edinburgh, uh, what kind of, uh, who should be given the priority? Should it be uh, the clean energy project or uh, those historical natural landscape that is uh, that are really abundant here? And second, about the role of government, market, and civil societies. I think uh, we should uh, decide on uh, the extent of responsibility of uh, that different sectors should be during the energy transition. Uh, for example, like how big the, gov the role that government should play. Should they have more regulations or put in more incentives or uh, just as a coordinator or moderator during this whole process? And also how should we consider about the role of local, local communities and civil societies during this uh, transition process? And third is political measures to energy transition and also the future governance of our energy system. I think uh, a lot of stakeholders I interviewed, uh, either from the government and uh, the academics, businesses, uh, civil society, et cetera, they agree to uh, reform our economy for the energy transition. But also there's a question about, uh, should we uh, think about a political redesign for the future energy governance? For example, should we delegate more power to local communities, allowing them to generate a uh, their own energy instead of staying to the master plan of our local energy system. Uh, so before I close my presentation, I want to share something about my experience uh, uh, in PCAM. I think during this process, I received a lot of help and support from this network, and I truly appreciate that. I hope like in the future, I can also spread this, ki this kindness and uh, do more for others that uh, I can help with. I think uh, this quote uh, can really summarize my experience uh, by involving in this project. Uh, this is a quote from my graduation letter. Uh, I think uh, I explained uh, the, uh, the phrase, be kind to others. Other is that uh, for uh, even like I graduated, but still I want to like keep learning and keep engaging uh, in those uh, climate research and then utilize uh, knowledge and skills to contribute to the Pekin project and uh, the sustainability and also the general good. Yeah, so thank you so much for listening. And if you wa uh, want more information, you can always email me. And thanks everyone, have a good day. Yeah. Thanks, Mookie. That was great. Um, so we've got a Q&A session now. Um, I think we've got 20 minutes um, for it on the agenda, but it doesn't have to be. We can have a longer break if necessary. Um, so I just wanted to invite any questions for the speakers. And then if anyone had questions on behalf of Yao or Nina, then Matt or I can try and um, answer. Um, so I don't, if you, if you have a question, then feel free to just unmute yourself and speak. Um, I have a question for Robert, um, and, but thank you all of you for your presentations. It was really, really great, actually. It's, it's so nice to be reminded of how brilliant the dissertations were last year, or yeah, last year especially as we're just about to go into the next lot. So really, really nice. Um, I was just wondering, we, we struggle a little bit to understand who is doing what in terms of business across mm -hmm. Edinburgh. And, and your presentation was, was so interesting in terms of you know, what motivates business to take action. I was wondering, I, I don't know if you mentioned this and I'm sorry if you did, but I was wondering what your opinion was in terms of sort of, do you think that the, 
that businesses really truly understand what they need to be doing? I mean, obviously there were elements that you picked out in terms of your framework there and, and, and you know, really great that there were bits missing clearly. So, you know, I, I was just wondering, we, we were discussing the idea of, um, you know, we kind of assume that key stakeholders like the council or the government are where people look to for motivation and especially business. But did you seem to see that? Is that where they go for their inspiration, their ideas, or is it more peer to peer? Um, so in terms of doing what, uh, I can confidently say that nobody's doing enough. Um, I think that businesses are often um, sort of looking, they still see climate action as almost a penance that they have to pay in order to participate in the market, right? Whereas what I think needs to be communicated is it's not so at all. It's, it's, it's a tool through which to derive greater advantage. And so to sort of say where certain businesses are at, I think the real winners, the real, the real businesses that are really innovating, that are really sort of ahead of the game are those that recognize climate change as a further like avenue of competitive advantage. Whereas there's a lot of traditional businesses still emerging which are, don't grasp climate change uh, and they don't let alone grasp it as a something that they can take and use and 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 you know cut you know massive corporations by being an S but uh, even though you're a small company just because you have this great idea for climate change and so it, I think that's something that I'm really trying to, every time I meet a business leader, sort of just sort of like, look at my framework. Do you understand what this means? Look, this is, this is a great way of making you some money and helping the planet, you know? And so, so no, I don't think that, I, I don't think businesses have a grasp of climate change, no, to answer your question. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. That's great. Yeah, you can really see this playing out with some of the really large companies that are not agile enough to think about this. And I like that idea of that they see it as a penance. Yeah. yeah that's really interesting. Thanks. Yeah. I also like to add that um, I do understand. So this is for everybody who's a student watching this and about to write their dissertations. Uh, I'm more than happy for uh, Rosanna and Matt to distribute my dissertation. If you guys want an example to look at to, and um, I know that others, from did that for us but I'm not sure if it was sort of like widely diffused like through the lecturers or everything whatever I'm very happy for that to go, go across um I think I think that might be quite helpful I, I certainly found it helpful last year anyway thanks Robert that's great um does anyone else have any questions Just shout out if you do I may have one. Go on, Francesca. For Muki. So I'm really interested in the connection between uh, ideology and governance. So um, maybe you already said that, but um, so do you think that actually more ide ideology and maybe more extremist ideology could actually um, give more potential to go towards um, the transition to more ecological societies. I'm talking, for example, uh, I was reading uh, about how maybe like um, extreme right wing uh, ideology, uh, you know, is like uh, very concerned about landscape and the environment and the local scale. Uh, you know, this is just an example, but do you think more ideology is actually, uh, has potential? Yeah, uh, thank you so much for this question. Actually, I think I also think a lot during uh, my uh, interviews and also my analysis and discussions, because like uh, in the end, I, uh, 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 in my recommendation, I uh, talk about like political measures to transition. Uh, actually, when I talk to a lot of stakeholders, uh, they also uh, I also mentioned about like uh, really 
uh, heavy environmental movement to put uh, pressures on businesses and uh, also government. Uh, and of course, uh, if we see a lot of movements from Extinction Rebellion, sometimes they can re be really effective. But uh, based on uh, my interviews, a lot of our stakeholders in Pika Network, they think um, maybe there's like a better way to, uh, to talk uh, through those uh, conversations to see if uh, we can merge those ideologies together to achieve the collective goal rather than just uh, letting one like really uh, radical movement to uh, to dominant the whole uh, group uh, groups of idea. So uh, personally, I think uh, there definitely need a lot of discussions about how people are going to uh, understand and uh, Except uh, each other's idea, and um, because in the end, uh, what we really want is not about whose idea is better, but how we're going to achieve this collaboration and then move forward. And I think for civil society, they have like really good potential, you know, to mobilize more people to raise their environmental awareness. And if we can really have a sincere talk and understand of their ideology, and then people work together, then there will be greater impact instead of people against each other. Thanks. Thanks, Vicky. Oh yeah, go on, Alice. Hi, uh, my name is Alice Haig. I'm actually a researcher up at the James Hutton Institute in Aberdeen, but I'm working with the PECAN network on a project. Um, and so I just got a general question for both of you, and you slightly touched on it, but it's also intended to kind of help encourage this year's um, MSc students. And that is essentially, did you know this time last year what you wanted to do for your dissertation? You know, how did you come to the idea? How much of it was, here's a starter of an idea. I need, I don't know quite where to go with it. Um, and how much was it? Um, absolutely, this is what I've been burning, you know, it's been my burning question since I started my MSc. So both of you are interested in that. Okay. Yeah. Would you like to go first or should I answer first? Uh, I'm okay with like anything, so. Yeah. Okay, then go for it. Uh, okay, so uh, I think uh, at the start of uh, last year, I remember like uh, I'm also trying to research my ideas because I did some readings during the uh, winter break. Uh, so I know like uh, some of my broad interest is about like a uh, climate responsibility relating to ethics and also uh, some, uh, some terms about like how we consider about our relations with environment and also the concept of freedom, etc. And then uh, after the begin at the beginning of semester, I chose like a uh, uh, political philosophy courses. It talks about a lot about uh, like uh, how you're going to understand the personal freedom and uh, your uh, public duty. So uh, these are, I think those are really good theories for me to prepare for my dissertation. And then gradually I generate the idea I'm trying to understand, okay, there are like so many different approaches you know, to achieve sustainability instead of like really radical one, we have to uh, stop using fossil fuel uh, all at once or like a more moderate approach. So um, I think it is like a, a process. It's just like uh, you you know like there you might have like a really broad idea, but you really don't know like the smaller point. And then as you read more and also uh, with engaging with your courses that you have and talk about people, uh, talk to people, sorry. Yeah, so gradually you just have this kind of idea and then finally decide that, yeah. So, um... To, to answer your question in short, no, I had no idea. Um, I know that Matt and I, um, when we first time we met, we had like a question that he saw, had a very broad question about the private sector and place, but um, the only time we met in person, funnily enough, since COVID, um, but uh, we, we had this idea and then I went away and I started doing research on my own. I started building this literature review and um, it was to do with place and private sector, but that's as far as it went. And I really couldn't tell you what the question is anymore. I've forgotten. But 
Um, I remember doing using this application for my uh, literature review called Envivo, which is great because you can get all your papers in there and you can start like highlighting quotes and dropping them into sort of categories. And that's where the framework was almost sort of born because I started color coding them. Okay, so all the red things are going to be financial and I just called them motivators, right? And then purple is external and sort of went down the rainbow. And, and, and I saw then after a week or two of like research, I thought, started looking at this and I was like, hold on, this is like a, this is something I can turn into something. And to Matt's credit, when I saw, told him about what I had inadvertently created, he's like, well, let's run with that. Let's explore that idea. And um, the, the, the research question completely changed and, uh, and hence the framework was created. Yeah, so that's, yeah, no, not at all. Okay, so that's cool. Thanks, it's interesting to hear where research ideas come from. So, yeah, yeah. Thank you. All right, thank you both, and thanks, Alice. Um, shall we? Well, we've stopped just in time for the break. So, if everyone wants to go and get a cup of tea or a coffee and be back by twenty-five past for the next presentation, that'd be great. So, I'll see you all in ten minutes. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, and also special thanks for potential supervisors who are in on the call, of which Alice Haig is, 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 is one. Um, yeah, I think in the, in the next uh, second break, it would be great if people want to introduce themselves, if, if they wish to continue of, um, discussions. It's great to see a face, and that will obviously encourage people to, uh, to continue the discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Muki and Robert. That was really